My name is Jack. I'm an engineer at Samsara, and I'm here today to talk to talk about um, kind of um, the problem statement at Samsara and our journey with choosing Amundsen, um, how we deployed it and things like that, and then kind of what the future lies. And um, I'll be hanging out for questions for a little bit after. So without further ado, let's dive in. Great. So kind of agenda of what I'm going to talk about. So first, I'll like introduce Samsara and our data landscape and try to like paint a picture for you of like what this looked like at the beginning, um, how we landed on Amundsen, our architecture and some major decisions we made along the way, how we augmented and populated Amundsen. So basically like how we added metadata, enabled um, stakeholders to add metadata, and then basically um, how we incentivize people to add metadata. I'll go through a demo with some screenshots. Um, and then I'll plug some custom features and contributions that we've pushed upstream. And then finally, um, I'll share some learnings and takeaways from our uh, exploration and project that could be useful to you. And then uh, we'll wrap up. Cool. So what is Samsar? So we're an IoT connected operations cloud platform. But what is that? Um, basically, we have millions of hardware devices all over North America and Europe. These devices are connected to a whole slew of different machines, equipment, vehicles, you could think everything from Toyota Priuses to 18 wheelers to tractors and fields. Um, and these devices send different pieces of data to our backend. So kind of the most simple example that we like to share is um, your basic location data. So these hardware devices up here in the top right have a GPS component and we send um, GPS latitude and longitude points to our backend. Um, that's one of many different type of pieces of data that we collect. We collect the amount of fuel being used, how fast the assets are going and things like that. And then we collect all of that data and some magic happens on the back end, and we display this data in a consumable dashboard for our users, which you can see here in the bottom right. Um, the main, so that's kind of the overview of what Samsara does. The main thing I want to drive home um, for the sake of this presentation is data is really at the heart of Samsara. So all of the experiences and features that we build for our customers is all powered by their own data. And so that leads us into our data landscape. Um, so if you look here on the right, I'm oh, sorry, on the left um, is some of our hardware devices. And these connect to what we call the Samsara cloud, which is essentially our backend. And then this cloud powers that dashboard. So this left side of this diagram is basically the customer experience. They hook up these devices, um, stream data automatically to the cloud, and then they get to use this nifty dashboard. Um, what I'm concerned about is our, um, our pipeline here on the right. So on our, right, on our right is basically our data landscape. So the data platform team, which I'm a member of, we've built some um, pipelines that fork off of the Samsara cloud and replicate our production data to an offline data storage, which is called the Samsara Data Lake. Um, this data lake is like 99% backed by Databricks Delta, which is, um, if you're unfamiliar, it's basically uh, a framework that brings asset transactions to data lakes. Um, and then we use Parquet files as our storage format. And then if we go over here on the right, um, basically data consumers are all internal stakeholders from all different um, areas of the business. We have, um, which you'd expect to be on here, data scientists and engineers. Going beyond that, we have a lot of support folks that use um, our data lake for debugging customer issues. Product managers use it um, to look at feature adoption and growth and plan out quarters ahead for projects. Growth marketers use it to see how people are using features and how they can drive engagement um, and many, many more. Um, and so our data consumers interact with our data lake via the Databricks interface. So um, we use Databricks as their notebooks feature as sort of the main way for folks to access data at Samsara. And then they can use different things such as Spark SQL, PySpark, build dashboards, build pipelines um, to interact with data. And yeah, so we built this kind of setup. It's changed a little bit over, over time, as you could imagine, um, a bit like two and a half years ago. And we basically built it to harness the power of data at Samsara. And it proved to be very, very fruitful. Um, consumers and users loved being able to access data in a scalable way on, on non-production systems. Um, but with that, um, our data volume started to grow and it's growing constantly every single day. So developers are able to come in here and add new tables to um, the data lake inside of the cloud uh, here pretty easily. And kind of um, what Mark alluded to, um, we ended up getting a lot of data, but not a lot of data management. Um, so we ended up having this spider web of tribal knowledge. So like different pockets of teams would own their tables and know how they worked. But if I wanted to try to access something new, it'd be really hard to figure out what was going on. A common question in Slack threads would be like, how do I find X, X being a data asset or something like that? 
So this was the problem we were running into as our data scaled. Great. Um, so yeah, the data platform was tasked with this problem uh, and we were gonna try to figure out how to do it. Um, we had examined, um, we did our due diligence here. We examined a lot of different open source solutions and we ended up land landing on Amundsen because it met all of our needs. Um, it was Python based. Um, so we mainly use Python in the data um, uh, ecosystem here at SimSAR. So that was good. Um, there was an active community, which I really liked um, knowing that there is development constantly happening and new features coming. And then there's already a rich feature set at its base. So it had, it checked off all the boxes for us, like owners, tags, um, all of that stuff. And then one big key component for us was that it had a Delta extractor out of the box. I believe I think like 99% sure is the only open source solution with a Delta extractor to actually extract metadata from Databricks Delta. Um, yeah, so we land on Amundsen, which was great. Great, so the first big step in this project was figuring out how to deploy Amundsen and what our architecture was gonna be. We spent a lot of time here. Um, we did a couple of different POCs with how we're gonna deploy it. Um, so we tried using the Docker Compose file using the ECS CLI. So the EC ECS being Elastic Container Service, AWS's container orchestration offering. Um, and you can actually deploy Compose files from there. Um, and then we looked into Kubernetes. Um, we don't use Kubernetes anywhere at Samsara, but um, we decided to give it a shot and kind of see how that would work. I had a little bit of experience at a, at a previous role. And then naively, we were able to SSH into an EC2 machine and run Docker Compose, and we could access Amundsen in that way. So after some testing, we actually landed on the Kubernetes solution with using Amazon's EKS, which is Elastic Kubernetes Service, in their uh, ma manage Kubernetes offering, using Helm to manage those Kubernetes uh, configuration files, and then Terraform to manage the resources. Um, so yeah, there was some pros and cons of this approach, just like any of them, but the pros outweighed the cons for us here. So first off, it was scalable right out of the box. So we could use auto scaling and um, EKS to manage um, our different pods uh, based on traffic. We were able to connect different AWS services very easily. Uh, we could leverage Fargate, uh, which is Amazon's um, serverless container offering. Um, so we could abstract away those low level container primitives that we don't really care about for a development intense project like this. And then the main downside here, which could be argued as an upside um, is the uh, learning curve. Um, so we hadn't used EKS or Helm at Samsara. Um, so we actually had to teach us our, these technologies out of the box, which pretty fun for a developer in my mind, but there definitely is um, some um, estimate, estimating that came into into play there. Yeah, so this is basically the final architecture here um, on the right, um, and I'll kind of go through the components. Um, first, um, we use the EK, EKS CLI for code deploy, so we don't do any continuous deploy. Um, the reason for that is, one, we didn't want to take the time to set it up, and two, um, we wanted developers to be very deliberate about how they're deploying Amundsen, and when they make a change, have to go through the process themselves. In addition, we can manage um, permissions on who can deploy and stuff like that, which is great. Yeah, second, second area, what I said earlier, um, with uh, hooking up different AWS services, we opted to use managed services out of the box from AWS rather than hosting this stuff ourselves. So I could have I could have ran run Elasticsearch as a Kubernetes pod, um, but that proved to be a little bit difficult. I didn't want to have to manage Elasticsearch. And so Amundsen provides some awesome configs just to point um, the search service straight over to Elasticsearch and I get all the management through there, which is great. Very similarly, we use EFS Elastic File System for the Neo4j storage back at, um, backed. And then we use um, Cognito for our auth, which we integrated with Okta and IT helped us out with that, which was cool. And then all of these resources were managed with Terraform, uh, which was great. We, are, we have extensive Terraform ecosystem at Samsara, so we could leverage that. Great, so now we have Amundsen actually running. Now let's get some data in it. Um, right off the bat, um, some kind of like primer knowledge here is that the uh, Delta connector is a bit different. So most of the connectors um, for uh, Amundsen are like API calls. So the, my example here is the BigQuery API, right? You put some credentials in, you call the API, and you get your list of tables. AWS Glue, very similarly, you call the AWS API, you get your list of tables and schema. The Delta connector is pretty different in that it's actual Spark code that needs to run on a Spark cluster. So the mix, this makes it a little bit tricky for like where we want to run this. Um, so we sussed out two ways to actually run Spark code. Um, the first one, we could run the Spark code within our EKS VPC as like a cron pod and um, actually connect to our Spark cluster. So our Spark cluster is a different VPC of EC2 machines handled run by Databricks. 
Um, so the positives here is that all code actually lives in EKS, which is great. Um, we don't have to be hopping between different jobs. But a big downside here, and ultimately the downfall of this approach, was the inter-VPC VPC communication. So it's my understanding that uh, inter-VPC communication is kind of an anti-pattern. VPCs within AWS kind of separate your cloud infrastructure. So this was kind of something we didn't want to do. Alternatively, we could run the Delta connector on Databricks and write to S3 as like an intermediate file storage. Um, kind of the opposite of the other approach, the downside is that the code is in multiple places, which isn't great, but we are able to overcome. Um, big upside here for us was that we have this um, CI CD pipeline for Spark jobs that actually runs jobs on Databricks, which folks all over Samsara use and we, we manage as a team. So we could utilize that to run this Delta connector as a Databricks job. And then lastly, we have all these metadata files in S3, which we have a lot of um, experience with, and we could look at them very quickly. Great. So we ultimately landed on the second option, and it's proven to be great for us. Um, basically, how what's different from this diagram and over here is kind of this ingestion path. So we have the Delta extractor running as a Spark job on Databricks, fully managed by Databricks. Um, we load those Neo4j ready CSV files, or I guess we could call it the um, the metadata service CSV files, whatever backend store you're using, um, into Amazon S3. And then we have a cron job running within our um, EKS cluster that's grabbing those files and loading them into Amundsen. So kind of the big takeaway here is that the stuff that's running within EKS needs to be talking to things within EKS and the stuff that doesn't isn't. Um, so this ingestion cron is talking to metadata and search service to load in that data. While the Delta extractor doesn't really, isn't concerned with EKS. We're just concerned with loading in um, files into S3. So kind of like separation of concerns there. And then one blocker for us that we ended up having to implement pretty quickly was actually de Delta nested parsing. Um, so I'll actually talk about that a little bit later during the uh, upstream contribution section. Great, um, so now we have table definitions, but they're completely empty. So that does not solve our problems. Now we had to actually uh, ingest metadata into Amundsen. So we separate them into priorities of what we thought our stakeholders were most concerned with, uh, P0, P1, and P2, and we did it in that order. For the sake of this talk and time, I'll only talk about our P0 um, metadata. Great, um, so quick backtrack. If I go back to this diagram and kind of what I mentioned before, where developers are able to insert tables into the Samsara Delta Lake by making pull requests and adding them to the Samsara cloud, and we decided to leverage that definition right off the bat for metadata. Um, so we use Go extensively at Samsara, that's our main language. So we had registries built up of tables that were replicating into our data lake. And then pretty easily, we were able to add, augment those definitions and add all of our metadata. So you can kind of see here, we had table name previously, and then we added these definitions to hold this metadata. So we added an owner field to add the owner of the table, tags like an array of strings for what we can tag this table with, description, actually the description of the table, then column descriptions, which is a map of string to string, being column descriptions to the description of those columns. Great, and a, a really big upside of this was that all of these, all this metadata had to go through code review. So it had to be okayed by someone on the team that this metadata was actually correct. And that was important for us because we didn't want folks to just be adding metadata willy nilly and kind of like thinking it's the right thing. We want to make sure there was eyes on what metadata was um, coming in. Great. And then once we had this, we actually had to get this into our Delta extractor via a, a data builder transformer. And so the way we did this was we ran a Go service. Luckily, we have a great SRE team here at Samsara that allows us to deploy Go services to AWS very, very quickly. And so we had a Go service called the metadata generator. And it used these registries and transformed them into JSON metadata files, basically a mapping of a table to its metadata. And we put these into S3. And then the Delta extractor, which is the same job that I've been referencing here, actually reference it, actually grabs those uh, JSON files from S3 and reads them in and then transforms, which is that transformer piece of the Amundsen data builder, and then puts them um, with those Neo4j ready CSV files into S3. So kind of the big takeaway here is we have this external service that's generating metadata based on this registry. And then we have that um, Delta extractor Databricks job is using those files. Great, um, so I'll dive a little bit into the code. I don't wanna go too nitty gritty here, um, stay at a high level um, for how this transformer works. But basically here's a table description transformer. 
It implements an interface uh, S3 file transform when you have to implement these two functions, yield metadata and then name. And yield metadata is receives a table that we've already read in from Databricks and then augments the metadata via the JSON file somehow. So in this example, the table description transformer, we're using the table metadata and then we're tacking on that description from this registry here. And so that's how we're able to, oops, yeah, that's how we're able to grab those descriptions um, and add them to the data builder model here. Um, a tangential example, um, like table owners, I think owner is actually a different model um, within data builder. So rather than tacking it on to the record, we are able to yield a, that model. And then that adds to our list of models when we're going to uh, render that metadata to JSON or to CSVs, I believe it is. If you look over here on our right, we actually wrap all of these transformers in a larger transformer that implements that data builder transformer class. So we can just shove it into our code that runs the ETL process. And then we have a list of all of our transformers. So here's a table owner transformer, table lineage transformer, and those constructors take in um, the S3 bucket where the file is, then the actual key where that JSON file is. Uh, and this was great. This is very extensible. And we built this specifically in this way because we wanted to allow other teams to be able to add new transformers and add new metadata. So this table lineage transform, which actually populates the Amundsen lineage feature was actually um, implemented by another team with our oversight. So it's really nice to have these extensible components for other teams to be able to add metadata so it doesn't fall all on maybe your data platform team or even one developer. Great, so we're almost there. Um, we have tables in Amundsen and a developer-friendly way to add metadata, but still everything is empty. So how are we gonna actually get our metadata in here? So actually shout out Mark for kind of the outline of this approach. Um, we use this idea of data champions. So we partnered with data leaders from all over the organization. And these were folks who were like passionate about data or utilize data, and they wanted to make the data experience and approach better at Samsara. Um, so we sent out a Google form uh, with data champions from each team, or sorry, we sent out a Google form to get data champions from each team. And these champions were responsible for corralling all team metadata and submitting it to the system um, via those um, ways that we talked about earlier with those registries. Um, and this could be either they could take it all on themselves or they could kind of siphon off different tables to folks on their team because they'd have the most knowledge on those tables. And then lastly, we actually offered prize incentives for folks that were adding the most metadata by team. So we made it a little bit of competition and gamified the experience, which was pretty fun. Some simple Uber Eats gift cards and things like that. And this worked really, really well for us. Um, the metadata push went from September 2nd to October 31st of last year. We annotated 330 tables. That's roughly 10 tables a day, which is a, that's a lot of velocity, which was great for us to get all the tables ready to go for our rollout of this product. Great, so that kind of uh, concludes the project portion and I'll hop into a quick demo. Um, so I only have screenshots, but this is basically our homepage. Um, you can see that we customized it and white labeled it, which I love that feature to make it look like we have other tools that kind of have this color as their um, uh, top banner. So it's nice to make it look like the experience is consistent. Um, and then one major change you probably will notice here is that we have the Samsara guides portion. Um, a lot of folks outside R&D who aren't familiar with the data model at Samsara use Amundsen to, to, as their like gateway to the data lake. And so we wanted to link these guys to make sure they had a place to start. So we have an Amundsen basics guide, which kind of um, helps folks get familiar. A search Amundsen guide, which basically looks in, or um, dives into that um, advanced search feature and tells you how to use it with like wild cards and things like that. And then we have guides how to add metadata to manage assets and unmanage assets. So those guides have been great for folks as like a first stop shop for how to use Amundsen. Cool, and here's a fully populated table detail page. Um, description, owners, tags, um, all from that registry. We do frequent users by parsing Databricks notebooks, which is kind of a cool feature. Um, last update, it comes straight from the Delta connector. You can see this metadata request form, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And then all of our columns here are annotated um, based on that registry uh, that I showed previously. Cool, so now I wanna talk about some custom features and contributions um, to try to maybe inspire you to use some of these things or kind of how to work your Amundsen with some new features. Cool, so what I mentioned before, Delta nested columns, this was a deal breaker for us that it didn't have it, but we were able to push it upstream. Um, shout out um, some of the Amundsen maintainers for helping me with this PR. Um, yeah, basically what we wanted to do here, and BigQuery actually already did this, the BigQuery extractor. So I had some nice um, 
kind of blueprint on how to do this. But basically, Delta allows you to have map, struct, and array types. And within those, you can keep nesting. So you can have structs of structs of structs and structs. And we do this um, because we have protobuf values inside our um, data lake. And we want to make sure that we can actually add columns to these uh, nested fields. Um, and so previously, you wouldn't have this value.date section. You would only have value and then this uh, modal pop-up. But value.date needs an annotation for us. And so we implemented that. So 1329 is actually the backend PR and 1326 is the rendering on the front end. So if you ever use Delta and you want these nested extractions, um, they're behind a configuration value to maintain backwards compatibility. Great. Um, one other thing is we generalize the application model. So if you're familiar with the application model from the Amundsen uh, like um, guides or whatever, um, it's only it was previously only compatible with Airflow. And the application model is basically saying, how is this data asset created? And so Airflow creates a lot of data assets for a lot of folks, but we don't use Airflow at Samsara. So we needed a better way to say what um, applications that we use. And so I was building this PR specifically to support Databricks. Um, but then I got some great feedback saying, why don't we just generalize it? And so now um, we support Airflow and Databricks as first class citizens, but you can implement any of these. Um, so yeah, I just put some examples here, but maybe you have glue um, jobs generating metadata or, or generating tables. Maybe you have EMR jobs, Athena, Snowflake, right? The possibilities are really endless. So you can utilize that to make your meta, so to uh, show people where metadata is generated and how. Cool. And then some others that I think are pretty cool. Um, we implemented a blanket uneditable schema option. So as I kind of mentioned before, we wanted our source of truth to be our backend code repository. So everything had to go through uh, code review. Um, rather than uh, folks coming into the Amundsen UI and editing stuff, it's not really reviewable. It would be kind of tough and not great for Amundsen to be the source of truth for us. Um, so we implemented this feature where basically if you set this configuration value to true, um, in your front end configuration, front end front end service configuration, there'll be no editing on the on the uh, UI. So our aim is really only a read application, which is beneficial for us. Cool. Um, yeah, we implemented S3 preview client. So last time I looked, I think the only preview client was Apache Superset. We don't run Superset at Samsar, and we didn't really want to. So we implemented a way to use S3 for data preview, which was cool. And then lastly, and kind of most excitingly. Um, at our previous uh, hackathon, I teamed up with some friends and we actually built a Databricks SQL dashboard extractor. Um, so Databricks SQL is their dashboard offering and we use it extensively at Samsara and it's actually modeled after Redash. So I used a Redash extractor and was able to implement um, Databricks SQL dashboard extractor. So yeah, those are just some of the features we've pushed upstream if you wanna use those or take a look. Great, so some learnings and takeaways. Um, yeah, this is a big multi-quarter project, multi-stakeholder, multi-developer. And so I learned a lot of things about um, or, from an organizational and technical perspective I wanted to share. So from an organizational perspective, loop in stakeholders early and set expectations. A lot of these internal projects, I find um, not to get a lot of stakeholder buy-in or PM support and estimate, estimates are sometimes off. But this is a pretty important project for like dev velocity and basically like anyone's data velocity at Samsar. So or any organization. So make sure you loop in stakeholders early. Um, metadata doesn't write itself. Uh, the data champions piece was probably the most work that we had to do. Um, so keep that in mind when scoping out this project. And then try to implement documenting data as a mindset. So data is an asset, just like a Python script is an asset, a Go service is an asset, an SQL table is an asset. And we document all of the former, right? Like people write comments in Go code, people write comments in Python. And data should be treated the exact same way. Um, so documenting data, annotating data, anything like that should be part of the develop, uh, developer's day-to-day -day work. And so being able to push that into their workflow is very important. And that's kind of what we were able to do with those Go registries. Um, and then lastly, on the organizational front, people like free food. So if you need to incentivize these kind of things and you can get buy-in from upper management, do it. Um, we had some Uber Eats parties and things like that for annotating data, which were pretty fun. Great, then on the technical front, um, definitely POC before diving into new infra. So that slide about how we decide on infra was basically all new stuff for me, using Kubernetes, using this ECS CLI deploy. And I think it would have been a really big mistake to pick one without POCing all of those. I see a lot of questions in like the Amundsen Slack group it's basically, what's the best way to deploy Amundsen? And I actually don't think there's a, an answer to that. 
Um, I think it all depends on what you're familiar with and what your organization's infrastructure looks like. Um, for us, we actually built it completely out of our organization's infrastructure, and that worked really well for us. But again, uh, make sure you test these things out before diving into one solution. Yeah, then uh, lastly on the technical side, push upstream if the open source project is responsive. Um, luckily for us, Amundsen's great. The maintainers review PRs very, very quickly and give feedback. And previously, we were trying to maintain patches and forks locally. And we were like, why don't we just try to push this upstream and see what happens? And now all of those things that I've mentioned earlier are there for anyone to use. So I think it's a cool thing to do if you're using the open source project to give back. In addition, you can avoid like those patches and forks and things like that. Great, uh, so just to wrap up here, uh, thanks everyone for hopping on this morning. I hope the talk was helpful slash uh, you learned something and you can bring back to your Amundsen deployment. Um, I'm in the Amundsen Slack group as at Jack Roof. Feel free to DM me any questions or anything like that. Um, and then yeah, quick plug for Samsara, I gotta do this. Uh, we're hiring um, specifically for these kind of data and Amundsen roles. We have a senior data engineer opening, but we have a ton of other job openings as well. If you're a back end person, full stack, front end, firmware, hardware, anything like that. So check out our careers page and reach out if interested. If you're curious about some of the technical challenges that we've also been working on at Samsara, um, our engineering blog is a great resource for that. I've written some stuff there as well, if you wanna check that out. And yeah, that's it for me. Um, I'll stay on for a little bit if there's any questions. And uh, yeah, thanks for the uh, opportunity, Mark. Oh, thank you. This was phenomenal. Uh, questions for Jack? Uh, I, I have a lot of questions, but unfortunately I have a, a meeting to get to. Um, but Jack, I'd love to connect with you offline. Yeah, that, feel this free. This is amazing. Thank, thanks for all this. this is, a lot of this is stuff that, uh, that I'm thinking about right now. Cool. Yeah. Feel free to DM me in the Amos and Slack group. Maybe we can get a channel going to like specific uh, feedback for here too, but yeah, let me know. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, so Reg, you had a question? Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks Mark. Um, hey Jack, uh, really cool. Uh, thanks a lot for like sharing a lot of the, uh, uh information. Just uh, had a question on the, um, have you guys used Amundsen for lineage? Yeah, so actually, I think I showed it briefly um, in our, yeah, so here we actually have this transformer for lineage where we grab the stuff. Um, so we grab the stuff out of a JSON file. Um, I actually wasn't the developer on that. Um, and I think it's behind a feature flag right now. So it's not fully rolled out, but we are in the process of implementing it. Oh, thanks. Yep. Jack, on that note, how are you generating that lineage? Yes, so that was actually the main uh, the main problem statement for the lineage transformer. Um, so we have a couple different ways that we do this. Um, the first one is we have this pipelining framework that's all defined by JSON files. So we created this um, this uh, domain specific language for pipeline definitions, and so generating lineage for that is very easy because we have it all mapped out. For SQL views and tables, it's a little trickier. I believe what we're working on, and I'm not 100% sure on this um, because I'm not the developer, but we basically parse SQL statements and get out, like if it's a join, we can get the from tables from there. And then we're able to, that's like where the lineage is coming from. And so that's how we're doing that for that. That makes sense. And are you doing something for linking notebooks to tables as well? Um, and within the context of lineage, no. But how we're kind of, and we actually haven't finished this yet either, but when I talked about that generalized application model, um, where is that? Yeah, here. So we implemented this for Databricks and how we want to use this is basically most of our uh, like source tables are generated from Databricks jobs. And I guess those aren't notebooks per se, but they are like Spark jobs. And so we link those, we want to link those into here so developers can come in and click on the Databricks job, it'll link them to the Databricks UI, and then they can see the runtime and success rate of generating those data assets. So a little bit different than notebooks, but kind of in the same vein. Cool. Other questions? I have a quick question for Jack. Go ahead. This yep. might be a pretty new question, but do you remember how you put uh, links in your Amundsen homepage, like the how-to guides? Oh, yeah, yeah. So this, I guess, like, yeah, this is completely custom, I would say. Like, there's no, uh, like, Amundsen model or extractor for this. 
we basically just went into the front end, like React code and hacked in these links. Gotcha. Thank you. So like very hacky and naive, but like it works. <laughs> Well, I'll ask one more while we wait for others. Um, you folks have done this thing where you have this registry where people can put in descriptions. These descriptions then flow into Amazon. Um, but you also on the detail page have some sort of propose a comment thing, pro propose a description thing. Could you walk us through what that workflow of the request form is and how this all works? Yes. So actually mid presentation, I realized for some reason, my slide on this got dropped. So I didn't get to talk about it. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, so this is a custom feature. And when I say that, I mean, we haven't pushed like a generalized version to Amundsen. Um, but I would be I would consider that if folks like this idea. But basically what we do here is, again, this is kind of for those R&D folks, non R&D folks that are using Amundsen. And during our metadata push, we did an awesome job, but we didn't get 100% of the way there. So there are some tables that aren't annotated. And so how this thing works, and it's on every table detail page, um, basically it's just an HTML form and a send request button. Very simple. But what happens is this uh, form response goes immediately to a Slack channel where all data champions and data stakeholders are in it. And it comes up in a nicely formatted message saying table name, the owner, the Slack channel of the owning team. So you can kind of see we have the Slack channel. So firm, this is pretty basic, but firmware's channel is firmware. <laughs> and then it has a link to Amundsen and then the actual HTML form. So an example here you could say is like, hi, I don't understand what org ID means for kinesisstats.ost log table size num rows. And then once it gets to that Slack channel, we as the data platform team can route it to the correct team to either answer or submit a PR to fix. So it's basically like, I know there was a, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is some sort of like request function within the Amons. I forget what it is. Maybe it was Jira or something like that, but that didn't really work for us. So we just implemented this in like a custom manner. And that's kind of how that works. Cool, other questions, comments? All right, that was phenomenal, Jack. Appreciate you taking the time to walk us through this and really amazing to see success of uh, Amundsen and Nat Samsara. James, you have a, you wanna actually unmute yourself and just um, share a little more here? Uh, sure, um, yeah, um, the, the Jira integration thing, this this send message thing is is really cool to me. I'm, I'm pretty uh, psyched about this idea. Um, we've built something internally, which is kind of, partially implemented. Um, so, so at Asana, we obviously don't use Jira. We use Asana for, for tracking <laughs> feedback that, that folks send to us. Um, and so we, we have built something out that basically integrates uh, Asana in, in a month. And so you can, you know, file a task basically that says there's some issue uh, mm -hmm. with this, uh, with this table. And um, it's something we, we, we actually, we have a task file already to commit this back to the open source project, but it's just, we haven't gotten to it yet. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to see the, as we were writing the Asana version, there was some stuff that was fairly well generalized and that we could reuse. And there's some stuff that maybe wasn't. Um, so if this kind of like have a text box that sends some feedback was like very generalized in in the UI, and then you could hook that into different backends. I think that would be that would be really cool, and that's something we might explore a little bit with our own version. Yeah, I could, I, I thought maybe it'd be helpful. I'll show a little example. So this is like my Slack channel of this, and basically it, we have a little bot that comes in from Amundsen metadata request for CloudDB.organizations, and then kind of the the message, and then the link to Amundsen owned by then the Slack channel. So this is kind of what this looks like. And yeah, I totally agree. I think it's almost harder to generalize these sort of like using a third party like Jira or uh, Slack. But yeah, we I, I think I think that'd be cool if you guys push upstream. And I've thought about how to do it for this, but I haven't figured it out yet. Yeah, this is this is really cool. And I, I love the idea of like, like we have some things that it's like if it's urgent it goes to Slack and if it's really urgent, it goes to, you know, and so it, it would be cool to have something like this that could go to multiple channels and teams could con configure it like this team wants it to go to Slack and this other team wants it to go to a project, but it's all, it looks the same to the end user. Um, this is pretty cool. Well, cool, cool. Jack, I know you had to go to another another meeting, so I'll let you yep. go. I thank you again for coming and 
really appreciate your time. No problem. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for listening, everyone.